everyone has a story. Stories have power. They help us understand each other. This is Jessup's Journal. Al, it's time to sign into Jessup's Journal. Hi, I'm Doug Jessup. Welcome to this episode of Jessup's Journal. With me today, Mr. Al Rounds. Al, thank you so much for coming. You're very welcome. Or actually, I guess I should say I came to you. You know, this is a beautiful studio. Thank you very much. Now, if I remember right, you used to have a studio uh, at City Creek. Yes. And then COVID, we'll just say COVID happened. And now you're, now you're here in your own place, which gives you a lot more time. And we talked a lot beforehand, but number one, I've been a fan of yours for a long time. You have a certain style. And there's something that I discovered that I did not know about you. I always thought, because your, your paintings are so precise and everything, I always just presumed that they were oil, but not the case. No. Watercolor. What's the deal with watercolor? Well, I'm, I'm a watercolorist now. My training in, in college was oil painting and the figure. But uh, after I had been uh, working right out of college and getting started as an artist, I found that I was spending way too many hours and wearing out on with my oil paints. And so I thought, well, <clears throat> I need to go out and just try a watercolor, the hateful watercolors <laughs> on the you know, hood of my uh, Subaru and uh, do a painting in a couple of hours. And, and that would be a lot easier on my physical, you know, body even. And uh, <clears throat> so that's what I started to do. And uh, so watercolors became, uh, they just took over. Uh, within a year, I wasn't doing any oil painting. And right now, I haven't done an oil painting in probably, I don't know, maybe 30 years. Wow. Yeah. So what's the biggest difference between the oil painting versus the watercolor? Um, Oh, there's a huge difference. There's so many differences, but the biggest one is um, watercolor is water-based, and water has moves and is alive and does its own thing. You know, when the when the valley floods, there's not a whole lot we can do to stop <laughs> those creeks, right? Yeah. Well, watercolor, you have to work on a flat surface and uh, move it. And an oil painter uh, is on an easel and it's flat. An oil painter pushes the paint and moves it around. A watercolorist puts it on and moves the, the paper to control the flow of what it does. Kind of like panning for gold. Kind of like panning for gold. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Now, talking about panning for gold, okay, this is a weird little transition, but you know, when I was a kid, I grew up in Southern California, okay, and we always heard about Sutter's Mill. Okay, you know, up in the San Francisco Bay Area. I understand you have a connection to the Bay. Yeah, that's a, we moved to the San Francisco Bay Area when I was six. My uh, parents, we lived in Ogden, Utah, and my dad worked for Del Monte, and he got transferred to the big office in San Francisco. And so we moved there. Uh, I was so mad at my parents <laughs> because I had a best friend next door, of course, and, and uh, but I'd been in Walnut Creek for maybe a couple of hours and I caught some lizards and a snake and something else in, in a bottle and it was like, what Utah, you know? Yep, you, you got this, yeah. you got this. So, now, I also understand you had an interesting little experience in third grade, third grade. Yes, I went to, to back to school night with my mom and dad and as we went walking in, the room there was a girl standing by the door and she said to her, her mother look mom there's the artist in our class and then i heard that that went deep into me and i said to myself i said yes that's what i am i'm an artist do you remember th this one i'm going to put you on the spot but do you remember the name of that girl no you know i've tried to look at the <laughs> the uh you know the picture that uh -huh. you have with all the kids on there i've scanned it and I can't, uh, I can't see a face on there. That, uh, so if, if you went to third grade with Al Rounds and your picture is out there, you know, we want to say hi. Yeah, if you were that girl, I want to know who you are. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So that's kind of crazy. Now, the other thing that I've noticed is that 
there are certain certain themes with with your paintings. A lot of it's landscape, but there's also something that I didn't realize when there's a person in a painting. How does that impact the way that you do that? Generally, I like, I leave people out of my paintings, even though I can paint the figure, because I, I want you to be the viewer in my painting. I want you to be able to walk into what I'm painting, be a participant in it. When you put a person in a painting, the, it becomes about that person that's in the painting. And people look at it and either agree with it or not or anything, but it's a totally different way of uh, the emotion changes. You connect with the person versus moving into the painting. Now there's, there's a painting. This is, this is not just your studio, this is your house. Okay? Yes. And there's, there's a painting upstairs that is above your fireplace that is in a meadow, and there's a young man. What's the story behind that painting? That painting is an interesting story. I, uh, it started when uh, uh, President Nelson said in conference, when he was announcing about the 200 year celebration, he said, go home and figure out what you need to do to prepare for that conference. And then um, I turned to Cynthia and I said, there are two paintings I needed to do, have wanted to do for a long time on the Sacred Grove, and I told her that I needed to get that painting done. And uh, so I started meeting with the church historian, uh, Don Anders, and I got, you know, spent a lot of time preparing, getting ready for that, and then COVID hit, and I couldn't go. And, uh, but I was so disappointed because I had worked so hard getting ready to do a painting. But last July, so a year ago from this month, I had a dream. And the dream was very clear and really interesting. I, there was no sound, but I could see this uh, young man standing on a grassy knoll. I was able to look at his clothes really closely. I could see he had on uh, pants that were too big for him. They were uh, coarsely made. I, he had a shirt that was way too large. I mean, they were both kind of drowning him. He had a blanket over his shoulders and a big floppy hat. Doug, you would have loved his hat. Gotta love hats. All okay. messed up yeah. and crunched up and everything. And I knew it was Joseph Smith when he was 14. And he was on his way to the Grove. And, and then my dream ended and I woke woke up and I told Cynthia about it. And um, so I can't paint from my head. I have to go someplace and research. I have to research a painting, but I have to go to the place. It's really important for me to kind of touch and feel the landscape or whatever I'm painting. Um, say if I'm doing a historical painting and then there's buildings in it that are not there. I build little models to um, help me visualize because I can't paint. I can see it in my head. It's like if I say to you, uh, draw me a horse. And you can see a horse in your mind and so can I. But I can't draw from that. Neither can I. <laughs> but that's just because I don't know how to do it. <laughs> that's frustrating to me as an artist. But I go find a horse and I can draw it. You know, if I can look at something, I can draw it. So I used my grandson. I rented clothes from This Is A Place Monument and dressed him up like I saw in my dream and uh, or similarly to my dream. And uh, I posed him out in the field. He was a good sport because, you know, 14-year-olds and he's 14, they stand a certain way. It's not <laughs> not a man with his shoulders back, you yeah, know. Well, they kind of slouch a bit. Well, and, I will say, just so you know, that the hat that, that he's wearing is also called a slouch. Just, oh, really? I'm not sure if that's coincidental, <laughs> but just say it. Just a little heavy on <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, anyway. So anyway, uh, I've worked through a real long, tedious process of trying to get it not to look like Isaiah, the, my model, but what was in my mind from the dream. Oh. And I, I spent months trying to get that face right. 
because I thought that was pretty important. So um, the painting is of Joseph on his way to the grove and he stopped and he's just thinking, don't know what he was thinking. But, uh, so that was, that's the painting that's upstairs. Okay. Now you're known for a couple different things. You, you, number one, you're known for some beautiful landscapes. But I've also noticed by walking through your gallery and, and as well as other parts of your home, that a lot of your paintings have symbolism um, for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Why is that? That was a dream as well. That came from a dream as well. Uh, I'd been painting full-time for about two years after I'd graduated from the U. And uh, I was just driving around painting beautiful things every day. I was living the life of an artist. I tell you, it was great fun. Just heading out every morning and not coming back until I had a few paintings under me. And uh, I had this dream, and in this dream, I was painting all these strange places. But I'd be out in the field, I'd be up on a mountainside, I'd be in front of a building, and I, couldn't, I didn't recognize any of the places that I was. And, but it was very real, real and clear. And when I woke up, I realized that they were all church history. So um, we packed, sold about everything that would not move. And uh, we I got a little Toyota truck with a camper on the back. And my wife and uh, uh, three small children, we headed out and we spent a month on the road uh, just trying to find my paintings that I saw. And uh, it was a, that was a great time. But it changed the way I painted because I was now, now not driving around trying to find my painting. I was having to study out where we were going. Uh, we'd go to the place and I'd have to try to find the place, but then I'd have to, you know, figure out what happened there. There was a lot of study involved in it. So w when I came back and started doing those paintings, um, it just changed the way I, I looked at everything. And now I'm painting things that aren't there, right? And uh, trying to make them beautiful paintings that just happened to be church history. And then with one of those very first paintings, I entered it in a show down at Brigham Young University. Uh, it used to be called the Mormon Arts Festival, I think is what it was called. It's now the, uh, the church's uh, international competition. But it was down to BYU, and I won a prize with a painting of the, I did of the Kirtland Temple on location there. And uh, the prize was that it would be on the cover of the Ensign magazine. Oh, wow. And so that is how I started with the church history paintings. It just sort of happened into itself, and I can uh, continue to do them. The church doesn't buy things from me. They do once in a while, but most everything I do is on my own. Independent people purchase them. Like someone, an independent person, purchased the painting of Joseph Smith. Oh, okay. And, um, and then I let the LDS Church use my copyright. So Al, there's something I've always kind of wondered. Okay, so when you're an artist, and this is your day job, you don't have anything else, do you get to kind of pick and choose what you paint and then sell those? Or do you do commissions where somebody comes and says, hey, I want you to do this? Well, both. Uh, commissions are wonderful because they're the only time you have a paycheck. You know, artists, <laughs> okay. artists live I don't know who you can compare us to, but you never know when you're gonna get paid. So whenever you sell a painting, you have to sit on it pretty carefully, what you've made out of it, because you don't know when you'll sell again. And uh, so a commission is a nice way of saying, I can do this painting next month, it will probably take me about 30 days, and I'll get X amount of dollars. And so that's a good feeling for an artist. Your prices are probably a little different than when you just started, but how do you determine how much to charge somebody? Well, in the beginning, it was what I could get away with. <laughs> really, I mean, I would do a painting for, you know, that would be this size for 
50 to $75. And I'm not kidding you, $50 of it might have been a frame. And, uh, and the, the purpose was to sell everything. So the next week, you would paint like crazy all week and return and try to do an outdoor thing or someplace where you could sell your paintings again. So I would sneak my price up a little bit at a time based on what I could get away with. If they stopped selling, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take the price up. And eventually it got so that I was getting enough money for my paintings that I could see a per square inch price. And so th that's pretty much how we go now. It's a, if a painting is 18 by 24, it's going to be so many square inches and it's going to be $18 a square inch. Okay, there you go. Now there's this is a sketch of something, but it's got a whole bunch of notes on it. What's, what's the deal here? A commission painting and up in Lewiston, Utah, mm -hmm. by a young lady, and she wanted me to do a painting of her grandfather's home up in Lewiston, because the farm was being sold and she wanted to preserve the memories that she had of going up there and Fourth of July and all the holidays would be up at Grandpa's house on the farm in Lewiston. So I went through all these small little sketches I actually are trying to pick their brain of what l looks good to them because um, everybody's different and they see things differently. And um, finally I came across one that she said, oh, I like that one, but I don't like this half of it. And so I scaled it down and this is what I came out with in terms of composition for the painting. Okay. And, uh, and then all the notes up there, she, I mean, this uh, home was very endearing to her. And I just felt like it was really important that I remember the things that were important to her. It's not like I want to include every single thing on a painting, but it's much like, uh, I try to paint the familiarness of a site. You know, I try to, uh, I try to capture the spirit of, of what I paint. I want you to be the, to come in and walk into it and have a relationship with what I'm painting. So if a person has uh, a lot of things that are very important to them, then I try to find a way to put it in a painting that's still a good painting, a beautiful painting, but uh, will also be reminders of uh, what's important to them. So that's what, I wrote all those things up so yeah. I could keep remembering them. You'd be surprised how you, you get so focused in on a painting, trying to figure out how to paint it, you know, the, the technical. technical part of it, mm -hmm. you forget everything. I mean, you forget appointments and everything. It's just like everything disappears, right? Well, there's one other thing that I noticed because you and I both share a love of gardening, okay? And so you have a beautiful garden here. And I've always teased people. I says, you know, about the only way to make my stories better is if you could add smell vision okay? <laughs> you know, and it's just like, so when you see this rose, you, you, you look at a rose to me and I, I can evoke that smell and everything. So, but I understand that you have your garden for a particular reason. Yeah, I do. I use my garden and my paintings. I plant it in such a way that, uh, you know, after all these years, I know certain things. I've got a picket fence with things growing through them or something. So. I kind of plant my garden with those things in mind so that I can use my flowers if I need them in a painting. I actually got that from being in England and going through all the gardens there. But when we visited uh, Beatrix Potter's home and I saw what she, you know, the grounds of her home, the home itself, it's neat to us because it's mm -hmm. an old stone uh, British home, but uh, it's not a, you know, architecturally it's not in beautiful, interesting, but the gardens make it very beautiful. Oh yeah. And so that would really had a profound effect on me when I was walking through there, and I thought I've got to do this in my yard, because I live in a tract home, you know, and I want to uh, 
uh, I want to walk through my yard and feel like I'm a Beatrix Potter. Just be home. careful of the rabbits. They'll eat all your carrots. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm just going to switch gears on you a little bit. And I noticed that you're wearing something special on your, yeah. your, your hand. Yeah. That's uh, my daughter, Megan, uh, passed away from a rare uh, form of bone cancer. And uh, she was uh, 37 at the time when she died. But her motto was, uh, be mighty. She was not interested in us or writing things like, Megan is fighting cancer and she's a great fighter and stuff like that. She just wanted us all to stay mighty in the things that we think about. And she was that way right to the end. But right before she passed away, she gave us all these bracelets. And uh, just really moments before she, uh, you know, a day or two before she passed away, uh, she said to me, Dad, don't take that off. And so I haven't. And I, I got a couple of extras and upstairs that I keep uh, in, a, in a Megan jar, you know. <laughs> And uh, so that uh, I keep it with me always. She was the only one of my daughters that could keep the rule. I, so I have seven children, six girls, and uh, Megan was the only one that could come in my studio and not talk. <laughs> you know, that was the rule. You can come out and see me anytime, but you can't talk. And I have a, a boatload of girls that love to talk. And Megan was the only one that could come out there and sit out there and read a book or just sit out there and not say much. And listening with your music. And listening with my music. So I, 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 inquiring minds want to know, what music does Al Rounds play when he's painting? Mostly uh, classical, but I do have my rock. And uh, I listen to my rock. And, and uh you know, I would say usually early in the morning, like when I'm starting my painting, I'll listen to some of my rock. Gets me going. Any particular group that we ought to say hi to? Oh, my gosh. I love Credence. And, uh, but, you know, I really love the Beatles. My girls of all. I just have a real love for that early rock and Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Oh, yeah. You've painted a lot of paintings over the last, what, 40 years, okay? If you had to pick one, okay, if you just had to pick one painting, which one would it be? Oh, that's a tough question, Doug, because I have probably 10 that are very dear to me. Mm. The, maybe the two strongest for me. One is of the Sacred Grove and one is of, uh, it's called My Father's House. It's of the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, both of those paintings speak peace to me personally. And, uh, but they are both paintings that I learned the most from. You know, when I went to paint the Sacred Grove the first time, I talked to Don Anders, and this was 35 years ago, maybe 40 years ago. And he told me what time of year to go and what, you, you know, time of the month uh, that uh, Joseph probably went into the grove. And so I went there. I went the last week of March and the first week of April, first couple weeks of April, and I kind of camped out and hung out there. And I about froze to death. It was so cold, and I wasn't prepared from it. And cold in New York is much colder than Salt Lake because it's very humid there. and. But the biggest thing that struck me was there were no leaves on the trees. No leaves. And um, I'd never thought of that before, because what have you ever yeah, seen? Yeah, you usually see the aspens and all, yeah, yeah. that's what you mean. And it's like that in the summertime. It's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. All the maple trees and the fir. Well, um, I learned so much from being there in that time period. So when I portrayed it, I remember I showed it to the Ensign magazine. They said, uh, that's not the Sacred Grove. And I said, <laughs> oh, yeah, it is, you know. Yeah. And it took them a couple of years before they used it. But this other painting of my father's house is of the Garden of Gethsemane. And Truman Manson was in Jerusalem. And Ann Manson and Dan Hone 
were all there helping me on the uh, accuracy of, uh, of all the things that would have been there. So I had these experts, you know, filling me in. Now, I learned so much by the time I finished that painting. So you were physically in Jerusalem? Uh-huh. Remember I told you I have to go there? Somebody can give me a thousand pictures and it doesn't help me. I need to go there and touch and feel. It's part of what helps me connect sort of the spiritual artisticness of a place. I, when I go there, I'm able to figure things out that way. So those two paintings constantly remind me of the peace and the good feelings I felt upon finishing the paintings and them actually working. This is my journal. Uh, folks at Rustico made it and it's got all kinds of scars and marks and all that kind of stuff. And they have a hashtag and it's the last question I'd like to ask everybody. So Al, how do you want to leave your mark? Well, I want people to remember me by, by my paintings and and perhaps the kind of person I try to be. You know, you can't paint what you don't know. And um, you can tell when somebody uh, does a painting and they really don't understand uh, the subject matter that they're painting. And that's kind of marks an amateur painting. But um, you can't fake things in painting. So you can't paint peace without trying to be a person of peace. You can't paint things of light without being a person that gives rather than takes. And uh, so I would think that I would love to be remembered by my paintings that brought peace. and You know, and a feeling of walking into and remembering good things. That's what I would like to be remembered. Well, thanks so much for coming on. And there are a couple other people we want to thank. You know, of course, we got Rustico that makes our journals. You've got Taylor Cooperative that makes the clothes. You've got JW Custom Hats that makes the hats. Of course, you got Clear, you know. You've thought about washing your hands, but have you ever thought about not getting, washing your nose? Clear nasal spray, good stuff. And then, of course, don't forget when you're washing your hands, you do have the folks at Five Wives that make that hand sanitizer and yeah, they make adult beverages too. Stories have power. They help us understand each other. With another entry into Jessup's journal, and Al Rounds, I'm Doug Jessup, ABC4 News.